you are very familiar with the validation process. And that ultimately, um, those real life challenges, uh, truly uh, real life challenges and the secrets to success will be also covered today. So just wanted to start out by saying, you know, this journey is not for the faint of heart. I know that all of you probably know that same thing. It takes a lot of courage, tons of persistence, and frankly, um, you know, you ultimately end up with uh, very passionate people carrying the torch for all of this work. Um, it takes uh, amazing passion, and we have a leader that does this uh, for us and has really carried the torch who couldn't be with us today, but her name is Deanna Tarno, and I just wanted to give a shout out to her because she's done an amazing job of putting this program together for BETA. So where do we begin? Well, uh, at Beta Healthcare Group, you know, we had always been talking about the importance of disclosure, um, disclosure and transparency, really trying to promote disclosure when uh, harm had occurred in our organizations and we became aware of that. Uh, we brought Tim McDonald out. Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with Tim McDonald, who came out in September of 2015 along with Tom Gallagher to talk through sort of what does that look like? You know, why, why do our words and actions really truly matter? And when we end up having these conversations, how can we do them more effectively? That was in 2015. And what happened was um, after our meeting and even during our meeting, we had been reflecting on some questions, questions from the audience. Um, one of which was really kind of um, sort of a challenge to all of us to sort of answer. But, um, but at the time, it was such an innocent question by one of our members um, that, you know, after a two day process of really talking about why we want to come out and be very truthful and honest um, and tell uh, patients and families when they've been harmed, you know, what has actually occurred and, and come to that truth. Um, the question then became from the audience, you know, do you really mean we're going to tell them the truth about what we learn? You know, and it was this aha moment that we had been talking about an end point of disclosure, but not necessarily taking them through the journey of, you know, how we begin to educate individuals in healthcare who are receiving healthcare and then ultimately begin those conversations very early on so we can raise that awareness and also really commit to a trusting relationship. So we sat at the end of this two-day process um, laying out what Beta had described as being what we hope to achieve um, on a napkin. And, and I know some others have written on napkins before, but this truly did take place on a napkin. And, um, so Tim, myself, uh, Deanna sat around and thought, you know, how can we really get this moving in our organization in a very methodical way that will hopefully achieve the purpose that we hope out, hope we'd uh, end up with um, seeing it all kind of play out over many, many years. So Beta Heart stands for Healing, Empathy, Accountability, Resolution, and Trust. Um, you know, we went down the path of really evaluating what this meant to beta and what this would mean to members and our patients. And by the way, we call um, our insured members because we're um, created a risk pool where individual organizations participate in our program and then are reallocated monies back through a premium process um, to commit to risk management strategies and services as well as provide claims and underwriting services. So Beta Heart really is purposed to create organization-wide culture change and transformation and to really reinstill the trust um, that patients and patient families have with um, healthcare and also um, address the trust that it really requires for us to employ caregivers or clinicians in our organization. So a very comprehensive program and process in order to achieve that whole uh, goal. So we began our journey and um, hearing from Tim, he talks a lot about connecting the heart to the head through stories. And <clears throat> Deanna and I had a very great opportunity to participate in um, 
in a program where we brought uh, Rosemary Gibson to the table and we learned a lot from her and her stories that she told of patients and error in healthcare. Um, what I did then was take this book with a big bow on it um, and set it before our board members as we started to introduce Theta's journey to our board and get our board on board. And so I gave them this book, and I remember our um, our chair of our board saying, you know, Heather, you know, culture change, you know, all well and good. It's kind of, you know, kind of the pie in the sky effort, you know, but, you know, how do you begin and, and really, you know, where does it all start? And I said to him, I said, you know, Jim, it, it starts with a book. <laughs> You know, and it starts with stories, because if we don't start connecting the heart to the head, we'll never get to that next place of really engaging individuals in this journey. So I asked each one of the board members to take the book back, read through the stories, and, and started to really engage with their heart um, as we move forward. We decided as our senior leadership team at Beta to create the structure together. Um, you know, you cannot do this in silo. It's not a risk management program. It's not a claims management program. It's really about getting everybody to the table and saying, you know, what is our philosophical um, uh, transformation going to look like? Uh, how are we going to message this to beta staff to ensure that everyone gets on board and that we move forward in a very um, holistic way to carry out our purpose. We also looked at engaging various key stakeholders in this process. So first we identified as uh, beta staff, as the senior leadership team, and then a few of our board members sitting around the table as a core team, who were those key stakeholders. And we decided that we really needed to meet with our defense council to get our defense council panel together to talk through, you know, what it was that Beta intended to carry out and then what that future direction might look like for them. So we met in two separate offices, both in the north and the south. We brought in the leads of our defense council um, and legal council and talked through exactly what Beta hoped to pursue. And um, I will say that that meeting was interesting in both offices and that uh, Defense Council kind of came, a few of them, uh, guns blazing, you know, do you mean to tell me we're gonna say we're sorry to all these people and, you know, and then just blow our case in the end. But um, that as they walked out, and they'd heard our approach, um, which ultimately is not apologizing, it's not the apology piece, but rather communicating effectively when we learn of events, learning of the events and making certain that we really do have culpability, and then ultimately introducing that information to patients and families on an ongoing basis to promote trust. They high-fived us on the way out and said, you know, we're in. So is that still the case today? Um, well, I think that many of our defense counsel really do um, and have a very ethical and principled approach to these conversations. And that ultimately um, those that don't can get weeded out. And so we've decided that, you know, we really wanna make certain that our partners are our partners and we have ongoing conversations with these folks and plan to bring them back this year to have another conversation. Um, we also convened um, a group of California carriers. So um, at first they were actually based only out of California. We've now um, broadened that outreach also where we have other carriers coming from other states. But we decided that we'd have a conversation with co-defendant carriers because we know that when we partner with our organizations, and of course, Beta insures primarily hospitals and not necessarily the physicians uh, that practice within those hospitals, that ultimately we're going to be meeting up with these conversations and we wanna make sure everybody gets on that same page. 
Uh, we now meet on a quarterly basis with these California partners, uh, carriers that actually represent both claims and risk um, in each carrier. And we have conversations about how we might move forward uh, together in this approach. And, um, and I will say this is um, kind of organically driven us to a point where we feel like we needed to create a, a nice protocol where organizations understand exactly um, in a standardized way how we can actually approach these conversations together in, in a collaborative way. So we've published a document called the California Carrier Protocol. Um, we had just finalized this and just actually um, distributed it back in December. And if any of you have interest in looking at that protocol, we're happy to share that with all of you after this call. So there were very tough questions that we had to answer. And I think we laid them out uh, quite well when we started talking through uh, our strategies at Beta with our board. So our board is made up of CEOs and CFOs from some of our member hospitals, um, some nurses, some risk management people, and ultimately there were a lot of questions. And several of these questions um, have been answered and several haven't. So we will say that um, we kind of methodically stepped through each one of these areas where we felt like we needed to engage and bring together um, thoughts. Um, that may be different from our own and in our own silo as an insurance company, you know, believing that we have the answers to those questions, but then also address how it might impact our member sites. So these were just some of the questions we, um, we needed to answer. And we're still in the process of answering some of these questions, to be quite frank. So I'm going to stop there. That, that's um, actually uh, just a moment to kind of get you uh, introduce to what that looked like as we move forward. If there's any questions now, I'm happy to um, open it up for dialogue um, and maybe we'll be answering those questions along the way. Steve, do you want to unmute the lines? All, all lines are unmuted. If you will, if you aren't speaking, if you would mute your phone, that'd be great. Any comments or questions for Heather? Okay, I'll move forward. So, um, so you see here on the screen that there are um, five domains of what we call Beta Heart. And this was modeled after the CANDOR project that was introduced uh, back in 2016, published on the ARC website, um, and brought together, you know, people, experts across the country to contribute to what they would believe and what we hope to pursue as the candor process. Beta then took it and sort of um, modified it such that we wanted to kind of methodically walk people through various domains of beta heart. So we split it into five different domains. I'm going to talk about each one individually, um, but suffice it to say that as part of beta heart, we actually incentivize our organizations to participate, and each one of these domains is worth 2% of an incentive uh, to back to our organizations once they've met the criteria of each one of the five domains. So essentially, organizations that do participate can earn up to 10% per year if they um, really have a robust process and have carried out each one of the steps that are required of them to meet each one of these domains. Um, we start out with having our organization's opt-in. So leadership at our member sites, primarily hospitals and healthcare entities, must have leadership sign-off. So CEO um, to the executive leadership team down and in the risk management arena also have very um, strong uh, support shown um, and at a station two on a formal document that is submitted into beta. Um, we host three workshops throughout the year to introduce them to each of the five domains. So we sponsor organizations to participate in the workshops, bringing in outside faculty, many of whom you know, Tom Gallagher being one, as well as Tim McDonald, and then of course we use David Marks, Alan Frankel, 
Um, we use uh, a lot of people from the Human Factors Arena and others to walk people through the content in um, areas where each one of the domains um, are introduced to our organization. We ask that executive leaders attend day one of the workshops uh, so we can get them introduced to our organizations and, and, and the structure um, moving forward with data's program. And then uh, we launch. So this is actually just showing in September of 2016 that we launched the program. We actually begin new waves each fall and each one of those five domains are actually trained to our organizations and core groups of our organizations through these workshops every year. And so each um, year we'll have both a beginning and an advanced uh, portion of the course content so people can bring in uh, new people into their organization get introduced in the beginning sessions or they can actually continue through the advanced sessions each year. <clears throat> um, we start out doing gap analyses and readiness assessments I'll talk a little bit more about the gap analysis process but ultimately uh, that has to actually take place prior to engaging in the workshops so right now, the reason why Deanna is not with us today is because she's outperforming a gap analysis at one of our member sites. And um, when we started out, I will say that we thought we might get five organizations participating in this whole program. And what happened was by 2018, we launched in 2016, by 2018, we had 39 organizations participating and we just launched wave four and we're now at 45. So very proud of the level of engagement of our organization. So we use the gap analysis as sort of a lens into what we believe we'll see in terms of culture at our organizations. Um, we engage various stakeholder groups um, throughout a day, uh, sometimes two, to get um, all voices at the table heard in terms of um, you know, where they believe their organization is and in terms of ready to adopt um, the strategies of Data Heart. And we open the, uh, the sessions up with, you know, really, you know, if you had the magic wand, what would that look like in terms of, um, you know, what you would hope to be better in the organization? Uh, what would bring you greater joy? Uh, and ultimately ask questions specific to sort of structure and process that are open-ended that allow the various individuals to speak up and share their views of the organization as a whole. We scribe um, all comments that are actually shared with us throughout the days and, and it's verbatim scribing comments throughout the days uh, with individuals that are answering the questions. And then we create sort of themes around these questions. So we sort of have that qualitative look at what is going on in the organization, uh, create a gap analysis and SWOT analysis, um, deliver that to the executive management team through an executive leadership report out. And, um, and this has really been an amazing process that has offered a nice snapshot um, in time by a smaller sample size of an organization, but yet serves as a nice preview to what we'll see coming out of culture survey activity, which I'll also cover as well. So the culture domain includes measurement and analysis of staff perceptions. It talks about and you know goes back to not only do we share the results of the survey, but we actually talk through the results of the survey. So another method to, um, to really collect qualitative information from the organization at a unit level. And then we expect our organizations to adopt just culture. And so if indeed through the gap analysis, we learn that just culture is not a formalized program and is not in place at the organization, that's sort of where we meet our organizations and begin the process. So as you know, culture transformation really requires a nice foundation of just culture principles and our um, 
our staff are actually trained in just culture. They're certified and can deliver uh, that content to our organizations. We also integrate the SEEPS model of um, human factors and work design. And so that in and of itself is also something that is taught to organizations in terms of just not looking at the human or that particular uh, decision making, but also really making certain we're looking at the system and the system design through the analysis of error. So um, in terms of culture measurement, we use, um, or we really ask our organizations to use a psychometrically sound, scientifically validated survey instrument to measure culture in the organization. And um, what we found was we identified a survey instrument that we use and we really try to promote um, because of the ability for our organizations to look not only at safety culture and teamwork, which the standard instruments do do, but also look at the engagement side of the house. Um, the piece of engagement that is so critical is really understanding where our caregivers sit in all of this. You know, how engaged are they in their work? Are they feeling a sense of workload stress? Are they burned out? You know, do we need to be attending to that? Because if there are um, issues with um, really engagement in the work that individuals are doing, it really can't carry out effectively um, really the strategies that are safe measures and safeguards. Oftentimes we see workarounds and shortcuts. So we thought that bringing together the two components, which is um, an instrument we use called SCORE, um, we would actually see a little bit of that uh, bear, it, uh, bear out in the data that we see. So we actually ask our organizations to administer a culture survey. We, we bring back the information um, through the scores. So that's the quantitative piece where we can say, you know what, we heard these stories during the gap analysis that um, and individuals shared their concerns about X, Y, and Z. But now we're actually seeing quantitatively um, that bear out as well. So it's nice to kind of mix the qualitative and quantitative piece and say, here's the evidence that shows. We use these metrics on the culture side of the house for each one of the five domains that we introduce. So these metrics from our culture survey itself, not only establish sort of, you know, what is that learning environment in the organization, but also, you know, how, how well are caregivers being cared for uh, within the organization as well. So we use these measurements throughout five domains and actually take each item and apply that as um, our measures of effectiveness. Um, we then actually, and this is kind of a, a look at what, um, what domains are made up of the culture instrument that we do use uh, the score instrument. So, you know, part and parcel to this and this work is really the end point of not only being very transparent, honest, and communicating um, the facts of what we learn through um, our investigation with patients and families, but really our ability to evolve and to learn about the defects in the organizations where um, we can fix them. So the end point is really about developing learning organizations that can address the defects and ultimately arrive at a better place for patient safety. So um, this here is actually on the left-hand side showing the culture domains of the score instrument that we use and the engagement domains on the right-hand side. So the workload, workload strain, uh, decision-making, and then of course turnover is really a big indicator of whether or not our people are engaged enough to learn about um, issues that are going on and then do something about that. And then on the personal burnout side of the house, that's something where you know we really need to figure that out because people aren't bur are too burned out to think about what they need to do, then they won't fix the problem. They'll just take shortcuts. So that too is also another indicator. This is actually a scatter plot that's just one of a few um, that we look at. So 
you can see here that there's a nice correlation that shows um, the burnout safety um, piece. So on the left-hand side where you see that red square and each one of those dots, those dots represent a specific unit in a given organization. And of course, all of this is made up of all of the beta work setting. So any given work, work setting, any given unit, and any given hospital. And um, it shows basically that, you know, there's lots of clustering of those who are burnt out and those who actually have um, a lesser perception or a lower perception of safety in the organization. So these help us actually prioritize those particular units and provide feedback to organizations about where to focus their attention. You know, on the right-hand side where you see that little green square, you probably don't need to focus a whole ton of attention in those areas where you see this, the green area and then even beyond that a bit. But where you really need to focus your attention is, is in those uh, ones on the upper left-hand corner and really kind of addressing, you know, what is going on in those various units that can help us understand uh, how to fix those defects there because it's likely where your claims are coming out of. And then, of course, um, if we're not necessarily supportive in, in the leadership realm of learning and um, there's a strong correlation between local leadership and individual work settings ability to learn will also um, not necessarily fix the defects that are among us. So we have to prioritize specific units in those specific areas as well. So that's just kind of illustrating what we learned from the culture survey. We believe that you know, sharing the results is good. Um, you know, we oftentimes go into the organizations and say, oh, they just had an engagement survey. This is how engaged you guys are. But we don't necessarily drill into the various questions um, where people score either high, where we have you know, appreciative inquiry or you know, ability to go in and ask you know, what's going on that's so well in this particular unit or to really kind of delve deep into, you know, why did you answer this question in, in the manner in, we, in which we did, kind of in a focus group conversation around the low scoring items. And oftentimes what happens is, you know, people will tell you what's wrong in their environment if we ask. Um, we don't ask. We typically go out and just share the results and that's the end of the conversation. Um, what we introduced is a concept of debriefing where we go to the organization's units, some of those scoring very high and some of those scoring very low, and then we open up conversations around what is going well or what isn't going so well in that particular unit, and then things that are going very well we can share with other units and things that aren't going so well we share uh, back up the other side. We have our organizations create action plans as a result of the low scoring items so we can move forward with performance improvement in those units. And because we know the culture is local, it doesn't necessarily apply house wide, we can actually get our um, attention more focused on the defects that are really, you know, the, the pebbles in the shoes in that particular unit and can fix those defects for our caregivers that create a better environment and hopefully improve burnout. So it's a very holistic approach, a lot of steps taken, but ultimately, you know, we, we need to know where people are at in terms of receptivity, in terms of their culture, and moving forward with learning in the organization, which is the ultimate goal. So this shows the continuum to achieve organizational learning, which we know is identifying that heart event or that CRP event. Um, we have teams that where we activate the heart response, we call it a heart response, a CRP response, uh, by reaching out to patient and family and starting those, that early communication with patient and family and then supporting our caregivers or peer supporters, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, to reviewing and analyzing the events so we can make certain that we're really getting the facts to the event um, laid out in a very clear and concise way and then carrying that out with, uh, to the term of communicating those uh, particular actions to resolve. So the event investigation piece is the second domain and that, is, that particular domain is really, really important. 
we look to that human factor. So we apply the speech model that I talked about, but we also look to um, making certain that we're collecting the information in a very interesting way, um, which to Jonathan Stewart's credit, some of you who may be familiar with one of our risk directors there, uh, brought these principles to beta as sort of, you know, evolving the RCA2 process. So we look um, first at meeting with our organizations to create sort of a current state through lean A3 methodology to determine where they're at with learning of events in their organization. You know, who gets notified? How does this work? Um, who responds to events in the organizations typically? And we sort of map it out with our organizations because the first key piece is Number one, raising awareness of the front line or individual practitioners to know that something bad has occurred, so we need to figure out what we need to do next. Uh, making certain that that you know, report process is in place and it's solid, but it ultimately carrying out each one of the steps that we learn you know, that there may be broken um, processes or perhaps inefficiencies built into our system that just allow us to learn of these events in a more timely way. So the goal is really timeliness and really getting to know of the, getting to know what happened uh, immediately after it's occurred, which is our challenge and it continues to be our challenge in our organization. Getting people to speak up and, and talk through that, which is why just culture is so important. The second piece of our event investigation is called cognitive interviewing, and that's what I was talking about with Jonathan, bringing these concepts to us. So this is born out of the NTSB and law enforcement, this whole concept. Um, it's called cognitive interviewing because what it does is it really promotes storytelling of what happened. Um, so individuals in a very independent way, not in a group setting, can kind of go back to that particular um, environment and reenact the event that took place. <clears throat> Why this is so important is, is because we actually need to prompt the memory recall and recreate the context of the event in a manner that is timely. So we have to learn of the event first, but secondarily, it, we tend to reframe memories as time goes on. So we may uh, believe something had occurred uh, in the way in which we've now reframed that memory and ultimately bring that information back to an RCA. And so we're not getting down to the core of really what happened or what had, what had been the environment at the time, but rather just our memory of what, that, what we believed took place. So cognitive interviewing requires us to actually open up conversations immediately after the event occurs. Going to that individual, having a conversation with that individual um, that enables them to sort of open up through their own eyes and sort of mindfulness through reflection to um, recall the event step by step in as much detail as possible and in a non-interrupted fashion where we can actually uh, understand what took place at the time and what was actually going on, uh, maybe cognitively or perhaps in the environment that impacted the decision making in a negative way. So the interviewee, uh, is asked to actually just kind of take us back to that particular circumstance. Um, help me understand what that environment looked like when you, you know, when perhaps you walked through the door. And, to, you know, just t tell me all of the details that you can see in that particular situation. We then scribe that information um, in a sense that we're taking limited notes but that we're kind of taking them back to key uh, components of this review that will then help us to sort of gather the, the information that's necessary that's specific to the event itself and not, not all of the, the rest of the information. So we sort of weed through it in a way 
where we um, identify key uh, points that the interviewee actually shares with us. And then after this meeting, we summarize those notes and we actually take that information back to the RCA. And so all of the interviewee's comments can actually be seen in the RCA where we can actually take them through the event itself and the RCA isn't as emotional necessarily. Maybe those folks aren't sitting at the table doing the RCA with us, but rather as unbiased individuals that, that know exactly how that process should have occurred. And yet now we have the fact pattern behind it. So that is actually an area where we're developing. Um, it's really based on the science and memory retrieval. And um, it is really um, coming out to be a really interesting methodology that we've introduced to our members um, throughout the course of BETA's uh, HEART program. Um, Guy Holman is the key contributor to this particular methodology out of UCLA. And he has worked closely with the BETA team. And if you have any information or have any more curiosity around this, um, we're, we're happy to either share it with you, uh, there's an article down below, or hear from you. So I'm going to stop there. Um, that's a lot of information, uh, two key components, and, and we have three more to go. So um, open it up for questions, Steve. And uh, the uh, phones are unmuted. If, if you're not speaking, if you would mute your phone, that would be great. Any questions for Heather? I guess without that, Heather, I'll uh, turn it back over to you. All right, awesome. So our third domain is communication and transparency. And of course, you know that empathy is, is key uh, to this piece. And not all of us have um, a degree of empathy that, um, that is fully developed. So what we do is we take that communication skills assessment that is in the CANDOR toolkit and we apply it to, um, to both uh, groups of individuals that either respond to events, communicating with patients and families, or respond to, um, to our caregivers as peer supporters. Um, we know that communication skills vary greatly. Um, we can actually measure that, and we use that communication assessment to kind of take um, key individuals that score on the right side of that bell curve and put them into teams that will be responding to patients and families when we know we have critical messages to uh, deliver, and we also need to learn uh, better to listen. So um, that particular communication assessment tool is found in the CANDOR toolkit. It takes us through components of cognitive complexity. People actually view, um, view specific uh, or their world around them through a very um, detailed lens. And others may not see as much detail in, in the world around them. So selecting the folks on the right side of the bell curve um, enables us to identify those that actually see um, greater detail or hear or perceive emotion at a higher level, and that ultimately can design messages in a more empathic way to deliver to patients and families in, um, in the face of a critical incident. Um, we actually look at this and, um, and assign those particular individuals to these teams. And when we do that, we can actually hone the skills of those that are on the right side of the bell curve, even in the middle or in the left side of the bell curve, you can hone. But we want to actually make these people super communicators um, in the sense that, you know, um, um, those that are practicing within us and among us, we know that there are special people that can deliver these messages, and it's likely that they actually score on that right side of the curve versus send out um, somebody who may not have that skill set 
um, just because they serve <coughs> in a specific role in the organization. Um, we use standardized patients to simulate the learning of these particular um, situations. So we, we use actors to come in and uh, practice these skills also in our workshops. And then we have toolkits and checklists for guiding and preparing for the communication with patients and families that help prompt those super communicators to kind of carry out that which um, we hope to achieve and, and, and communicate to patients and families when they've been harmed. The fourth domain is care for the caregiver. We know if we don't care for our caregivers, they cannot care for others. Um, we know the impact of patient harm. We've seen the suicide rate just grow um, just in an amazing way over the last several years. And we know that um, it's important to actually have peers supporting others when they've been involved in events such as this. We have a comprehensive set of, yes. Uh, there's a question yes. that does peer support include support for non-physician team members involved in events? It does. Um, a lot of feedback. Um, it does. Actually, what we do is we take the peer supporters in organizations and um, train them to uh, respond to nursing, respond to housekeeping, respond to any, any individual role within the organization, um, including physicians. But those non-physicians are really, really important. Does that answer your question? Hopefully, I think you guys are on mute again. <laughs> uh, thank you, yeah, yeah, thank you very question. much. Perfect. So we have a full toolkit that actually um, sets directed toward uh, building uh, the skill set of peer supporters in a given organization. And that particular piece involves a lot of training of the peer supporters, which we do have also. And, um, and then we track those peer encounters and have a feedback system for not only those that have experienced the peer support, but also those who actually are delivering that peer support. Because we know also what we've identified is it's very stressful for the peer supporters to be receiving that information as well. So we have um, structures and processes in place in order to address those as well. And as you can see with culture, you know, the, po the personal burnout domain really correlates well with that care for the caregiver program. So that serves as one of our measurement strategies, um, looking at, you know, how well people are affected um, either positively or negatively um, in, in the healthcare environment by these particular events. And this particular item is really um, critical to look at. Finally, we have an early resolution part of this. So I know that this is sort of like the end point of CRP, you know, did we resolve these things and did we do it in the right way? So we're uh, very much a supporter of looking at not only um, the physical harm that's involved, but the emotional and financial harm that's involved as well. And I will say that, you know, for early resolution, it's not about necessarily throwing money at the situation. It's really about making certain that we're meeting patients and families where they are, um, that will help heal them and in the most um, um, comprehensive way we can, though we can never fully heal. Um, identifying you know, non-financial means meaningful means is so important. And I think that ultimately we, um, we always think about that early resolution as being money or monetary um, resolution, but I think we need to be reframing that a bit and thinking about what is truly meaningful to that patient or family. It could be a bench, it could be a memoriam, it could be um, participating on a committee or what have you. And we're really trying to promote um, other means as well. Um, as we move forward with our beta heart members. Um, the, the early resolution piece um, we felt needed to also be more specific. And so um, I will say that we've um, used a protocol um, that we publish as well that kind of takes people through um, the various aspects. 
So this includes not only how do we determine there's a heart event, um, but also uh, when we come together uh, through the RCA process, the collaborative case review, we've renamed that. Um, we use the information that's collected in the cognitive interviewing and that we actually take that through a very comprehensive process to arrive at um, uh, um, particular issues that have evolved as a result of this particular event, learn of that and then communicate that to the patient and family. Um, we know that there's a peer review process within hospitals and healthcare organizations that ultimately has to take place and we've sort of aligned our thinking with not only the RCA process but also the peer review process that may be simultaneously um, occurring as a result of this and how do we bring those two um, pieces together um, by um, making certain that we're sharing information but sharing information um, um, that is still protected and, and um, still maintains the, the required protections under peer review. Um, we developed what's called a stakeholder consensus meeting where we bring this information back. And um, if there are multiple parties involved that the stakeholders are actually brought to the table to have a conversation about how, if there are two carriers involved, for example, we come together and have that uh, conversation about not only valuing a case, but perhaps um, moving it more towards the resolution together. And then, of course, we've said you no know, and outlined many things in terms of how to determine the damages, what to consider as a result of this um, you know, final piece, and then how well, might we come together and uh, reach resolution. This is really just an excerpt of this whole early resolution process that's been published, and it kind of shows you um, the key aspects of of how we conduct our stakeholder consensus meetings. We have a guideline. Um, each one of those elements, uh, the five domains, have very specific uh, methodical approach to arriving at the completion of a domain. So the guideline itself establishes various subcomponents and then, of course, is validated and measured at the end of the year so we can ensure that uh, the robust process is, has indeed been adopted and that it's actually in practice. Um, just a note about the event valid validation piece. I know that in the state of Washington, um, we have actually modeled that in the state of California for event and val um, validation. Um, you guys have done a great job in Washington carrying that out. Um, we're trying to do the very same thing. So we've put together a validation application similar to um, what was published by the Foundation for Healthcare Quality and Steve's work and all of you guys. Um, and I will say that, you know, it's hard to get cases um, submitted to and through our validation process. But we've actually weaved that into the requirement of Beta Heart, where they are required on an annual basis to submit at least one case where they are looking for a domain to be um, validated and incentives applied to that domain. So we're hoping to get a little bit more uptake on those submissions. We currently have five submissions um, and we have a few more in the queue, but it is a slow process. Um, and I will say that I think it's very valuable because I believe that um, the value of learning and that feedback mechanism that is um, provided to our member organizations who do submit cases has been critical for the overall kind of development at the organizations and the level of sophistication they may have with CRP in general. We measure their performance, and I talked about the culture piece, but we also have adopted a lot of the National Metrics Task Force work um, through uh, various strategies. We look at a lot of things uh, in terms of just measurements, period, overall, in terms of our program and the program design. But we also look at outcomes related to claims and that claims piece, so claims open, closed, resolve, pre-lit and making certain that we're kind of seeing the defense costs and the indemnity costs drive down. So um, those pieces are part and parcel to all of this. 
We have now asked our organizations to submit information um, specific to um, various pieces of information that they collect at the unit level or at the organization's level um, in terms of timeliness and, you know, the response of peer supporters, et cetera. So, um, so through an Excel process, we're actually collecting some of that information that will ultimately be fed into a dashboard um, that will be published for our organizations. This is just one of the uh, key pages of that heart dashboard and provides the feedback and sort of our overall analysis of how our heart program is going at beta and how this particular program is working for the member organizations that are participating. Um, you know, we've enhanced internal communication as well. So that, you know, we started out with this whole piece of, um, you know, wow, you know, um, how does claims and risk kind of come together? One of the challenges we had early on, um, and of course at one of our um, beta board member sites is that we didn't necessarily internally, uh, risk management at beta and claims at beta come together and talk through the events with our members. Um, initially. So what we've done is we've enhanced um, our internal communication by making certain that we have a pre-claim um, event process where when it's an uh, incident reported to BETA by one of our BETA Heart members or even outside of the BETA Heart um, program, that we actually come together um, both claims and risk and have an internal conversation and then contact the organizations to have an external conversation. Um, we have heart leads within our organizations that will um, be uh, reporting items to us and ultimately we carry that through as a pre-claim event so as not to um, um, uh, trigger coverage necessarily, but rather that we just learn of this event and we can carry through um, through the key aspects of, of delivering what we believe is a hard approach to our organization and ultimately moving that through and avoiding that written claim. So um, we do um, have an automated process now built in where we have an alert functionality when we have an incident recorded to either a claims person or a risk person that then notifies uh, the other of that. And that's how we come together to learn of that. So what have we learned? Um, we've learned a lot. Uh, and we're now in our fourth year of moving forward, we, we know that leadership is key. Um, there really has to be visibility of leadership um, who is constantly verbalizing their support. Um, that applies to carriers as well, which is what we learned through the California partners is that, you know, um, it's all well and good for the vice president of claims to be, you know, on board and, and, and really promoting this, but it really has to filter down to those frontline claims reps who are having those conversations or, you know, moving forward with conversations um, or counsel to, um, to those who they ensure. So um, that is key to the process of just making it certain that leadership at all levels is engaged and promoting and, and really supporting this process. We know that there's turnover and that applies both internally and externally um, to our members. There's turnover in the organizations where some learn about the hard events and, and move forward, um, you know, and then all of a sudden decide, you know, they're leaving the organization or ends up, you know, you know, the wheels fall off. And so we have to go back in and retrain or reintroduce or what have you. So we have to be very sensitive to the organization's resources all along the way, but also the turnover truly does impact the progress at organizations. And, and we just have to be more mindful of how we're delivering um, the information and keeping on top of that. Um, Many organizations um, have never shared their culture data or never really looked at it in, in the manner in which we're looking at that. And so we've um, had to teach to this and really try to promote um, a little bit more um, uh, awareness around the use of culture data and how it can be used. Um, 
event review and analysis, you know, we again have to get to that front line. And, um, and we believe that there's probably an opportunity to get a little bit more education um, in that regard to our front line. So um, that is part and parcel to our journey and it remains a challenge. Uh, just culture principles are not necessarily embedded in the organization. We learn a lot of that through the gap analysis process and also through our cult culture instrument. Um, people don't feel safe speaking up and, and that often gets um, actually translated to um, what we believe are just culture principles and how people are managed when um, they do make errors. And then care for the caregiver piece is really, um, really interesting. We started out believing that to be the fourth domain, but our organizations have truly dedicated um, and committed resources toward moving that first through the process where um, they can demonstrate that their caregivers are um, truly the priority and are cared for uh, before they move forward with saying, you know, let's have these difficult conversations or let's commit to X, Y, and Z. So that has been um, something where we adjusted the priority and focus on making certain that a very solid care for the caregiver program was first initiated and instituted and then moving forward with the rest of the program uh, to follow. And of course, communication um, is critical. We know that if we're not empathic, you know, and not only just to patients, families, but to our caregivers, um, we can't necessarily um, believe this can be fully carried out. So, um, so screening for this is critical. And honestly, um, you want to have those most talented um, individuals go in and have that conversation. Oftentimes what we found was it was the risk manager who was assigned to have these difficult conversations. Um, it may have been the CMO at our organizations. There may be specific doctors in the organizations that would have it or the CEO, but those people are not always the right people. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, and um, we just have to be more mindful about who are those right people. And then, of course, carrier involvement and our um, commitment to trust one another has been crucial. Um, you know, bringing together the California carriers and having conversations about where we're at and becoming more trusting of one another um, has been really the journey. And, um, and if we don't get together and have these conversations and really begin to walk the talk, um, we'll never get to that next stage of, of really coming together and doing the right thing for patients and families. We admit, and we fully admit, that we don't have all the answers. Um, we're still working on some of those answers. And so it's a sensitive place, and it's, but it's been a, an incredible journey. We're very appreciative for all whom we've learned from, because this didn't come from beta. It's come from a lot of others. I see. Yes. Um, I see that it's the end of the time, so my apologies. Um, Steve, can you hear me? Heather, this is Tom. That was uh, that was outstanding, and uh, uh, I don't know if folks have a question or two. If your lines are unmuted, but uh, thank you so much for that uh, comprehensive overview of beta. Absolutely. Uh, Heather, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, there was a question about emotional support for patients and families. Um, do you give that, provide that? Through our peer supporter system, through emotional support um, in terms of, um, you know, having this open-ended conversations, we do coach to that. We, we don't 
personally provide that emotional support because the organizations that we're actually um, working with that provide that emotional support, but we teach to that and coach to that. Is that, was it patients and families you're speaking of or is it, um, is it caregivers that you're supporting? Uh, be patients and families. We definitely uh, believe that, you know, conversations need to have, um, uh, we need to have many conversations. It's not just one conversation. It's continuing support of patients and families as we move forward through this process. So um, we definitely teach to that. And, and if, if we're needed, we're used as a resource to do that. Does, um, anyone else have any, any questions at all? Well, Heather, thank you very much. This was a great webinar. And just so everyone knows, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted with the slides on the Collaborative for Accountability Improvements website in the Tools and Resources page in the next two or three weeks. So if there are no other questions, thank you very much. Heather, thank you again, and that will end the webinar.